heard a lot of phenomenal ideas, really important work happening um, both in the region and in other locales. Uh, what we haven't talked about are the many ways that these different initiatives can and should be financed and funded and invested in. Um, there is a lot of complexity associated with that topic, um, given the complexity of the system. Uh, so we're going to attempt to surface some models, some ideas, have conversations um, on stage now um, with Victor. We'll welcome Victor back up to the stage. There he is. I see him back there. Uh, and we're going to start with Alex um, from Iroquois Valley my get Farms. Great. Uh, who is going to talk very specifically about the, the investment model that they're using um, to solve for a particular part of this, uh, this overall investment equation, and then we'll have um, more of a conversation. So, Alex and Victor. Um, so I'm going to try to blow through. I have five slides, and I'm going to try to do it in you know five minutes so that we can have a conversation. I realize what it's like to sit there and listen for so long. Um, but I, I really want to make the point that we are, a, we are a live dog. We are an investable opportunity. We could sit down over a beer or three after this with my computer and you could invest in Iroquois Valley Farms. So I say that not only to raise money because that's my job, but also because I'm trying to illustrate that there are active opportunities in the market today where you can take an IRA or an, a tiny sleeve of your portfolio and make a fundamental difference in the way that food is being produced and the environment is being treated as a result. So it's a really important uh, thing to think about as you consider all these challenges that we're facing. So Iroquois Valley Farms is a ch Chicago-based company. We are a B Corporation. We are a public benefit corporation with the stated benefit purpose of enabling healthy food production, soil restoration, and water quality improvements through the establishment of sustainable farmland access. So what does that mean? We are helping farmers access farmland in areas that they normally would not based on the um, inefficiency and inabilities of traditional uh, ag finance. Um, we have $50 million in assets spread around 14 states being farmed by 37 different farm families who are running their own businesses. Um, we are as far east as Maine and as far west as Montana, up near Haver. We would love to be a, in Idaho if the right farmer approached us, and we can talk about that at length as well um, after, I guess. Okay, the pictures didn't come through. Those were beautiful pictures of our farmers. I, I will not take the blame for that. Um, but. Um, the most important thing about us is that we react to the needs of farmers. We are not raising money, buying farmland, and then looking around for someone to farm it. We are taking phone calls and emails from individual farm entrepreneurs who need access to land. One of the biggest barriers to farmers converting our soil from conventional to organic is the financing of land. Land is expensive. It's increasingly um, to the pressures of development, um, and there are also large corporate opportunity or corporate groups and you know sovereign wealth funds that are looking to buy farmland as a hedge for their portfolio or whatever it, it, the case may be. So getting a piece of land to farm is a difficult thing, even if you are an established operator. When the company started in 2008, right at the height of the financial crisis, if you were a farmer in, in Indiana who walked into a traditional ag bank and tried to get financing for an organic operation, the answer was always no. And that's really why this company started, with people wanting to finance this transition from conventional to organic. Uh, we have a lot of young farmers. We have a lot of experienced young farmers. The average uh, generational, um, I guess, the average generation of our farmers is fourth. So we have a lot of farmers from farm families. But we also have a lot of young and up-and-comers. We're also creating this incredible model of broad-based investment support. We have over 350 investors throughout both our equity and debt pro uh, products. A lot of that money is coming through their traditional brokerage account, um, through IRAs, through joint revocable trusts, through entities that they've created. But our average investment size is $100,000. At this point, it's all accredited investors. That's actually a really small amount in the accredited invested, inf investor world. Our minimum is $30,000, very accessible for the accredited investor. So we're trying to create a democratic, broad base of support for this diversified pool of farmers working the land because we feel it's very important that no one single entity can decide they want to cash in on their farmland investment and force the farmer off the land. 
we have created an entity that allows us to keep the land indefinitely for our farm partners which incentivizes them to put the time and money and effort into improving the soil with all the added social, environmental, and uh, financial benefits. So that's key to our model, and I can talk about that during the question and answer section. Um, we're also gonna do a non-accredited offering before the end of the year. It's gonna have a $10,000 minimum. It's gonna be open to anyone who um, can show that it's not an undue risk to their investment portfolio. Um, a regulation A plus for those in the investment world. And it should be pretty exciting. It's kind of like our quote public offering. It's not a public offering, but really letting more and more people access organic farmland as an asset class. So, um, you know, we've talked, I mean, I wish every pitch call I did just started with the last three and a half hours of meetings, because <laughs> I would, I'd be raising money hand over fist. Um, I'm not gonna go over all this again. We've, we've talked about it ad nauseum, but Organic is a real thing. I think there were some discussions last night at my dinner table about you know, what is organic. Just really quickly, the USDA definition of organic, not exactly the highest bar, is integrating cultural, biological, and mechanical practices that foster cycles of resources, promote ecological balance, and conserve biological diversity. That's on the USDA website as we sit here right now with this administration. And that is the lo all of our farmers are either certified organic or working towards organic certification. So that is the kind of minimum threshold. That's, that's, that's big. And as someone has said, only 1% of the farmland in this country is certified organic. 5% of our food consumption, $60 billion last year of organic food was sold in this country. It's a major opportunity. And I think, you know, we shouldn't let perfect be the enemy of good. Organic is an amazing start on the way to regenerative or whatever the next certification is, but it's very important for our soil, for our water, for our economic vitality in rural communities to give these farmers a price premium at market as a result of organic certification. Um, and then the last thing I'll say um, is that this is a model that can scale either within us, we're trying to double in size in the next two years, we have an awesome track record, 11 years, we have a very great balance sheet. We have a conservative leverage, leverage ratio. We are getting a lot of interest from bigger and bigger ticket investors, although a cool thing about REITs is that no one investor can own more than 10% of the company. So it really enables this broad base of support to grow. Um, but if you're wondering, what do I do? What you do is invest in companies that have positive impacts and are creating a financial return. And I think that I'm all for publicly traded companies doing all the ESG work that they, they're doing. We're an example of a company whose entire existence is based around social, environmental, and economic benefit. So that's another way to skin the cat and one that I hope you guys are interested in talking to me about. So with that, I'll sit down and have a conversation. And feel free to change my slide too. Which one? <laughs> Um, do, does anyone have any questions um, just before we, we move on? Amy. Yeah, Amy. Sure. Right now we're working on a transaction in Minnesota with a third generation farmer who's come back after doing some Silicon Valley stuff and working in Washington. He's uh, probably in his early 30s. We think he's going to be governor of Minnesota at some point, but he's returning home to farm. He's buying a, or we, I think we're going to do a mortgage for him. We're buying a chunk of land from a farmer who's been identified as one of the worst farmers in Minnesota for the environment. We feel like that's a cool win where we're just, you know, slicing off this tiny piece of their, of this farmland that's been um, so bad for the soil and, and for human health. And we are going to finance him to create a, I think it's probably a $700,000 deal. Um, we are, he's going to do a row crop rotation with cover crops. And, you know, um, he's also doing strawberries. So he's growing grains, the buzzword of the last hour. Um, corn, soy, edible beans, probably barley. You know, people, I'm not a farmer, as you can tell. Um, sunflowers, oats, whatever he needs to do to create that biodiversity to organically farm in a productive manner. Um, and he is just an example of a young farmer who is returning to his community, growing nutritious food, and we're creating a financing package for him 
that allows him to get through that three-year transition from conventional to organic, where he will have, as a lot of our farmers call, the trough of despair. It's very difficult to convert a piece of farmland from conventional to organic because your cash flow isn't that good. You're farming organically, but you can't charge organic prices at market until after year three. So that makes your fundamentals um, difficult, but that's where our leases and mortgages are designed to help farmers get through that process and you know, really have our investors align their capital for the long term so that we can have the economic benefit down the road. Yeah, good question. Um, we're in growth mode now, so we're so we're an operating company. We're not a fund. So our revenue is all our lease and mortgage payments coming into the company, and then our operating costs are you know me being here, staying at this beautiful hotel, um, and then whatever's left over after servicing our debt is our net income, and that's the distribution as a dividend. Last year it was one percent cash, and our share price went up two percent. We would estimate that medium term we can do two to three percent cash plus the appreciation of the land, which the USDA estimates for conventional land to be around 6% a year. So you're looking like all told between 7 and 11% per year, which I would say for farmland is, at, is market rate. Um, and you know, I'm sure someone in the room who's better at finance than me will argue about that, but um, I, would, I would basically challenge everyone to look about the farmland they own in their portfolio and see what it's doing to the labor force, to the environment, et cetera. So yeah, seven to 11%, but farmland prices are cyclical and grain prices are in the tank right now, so so are farmland prices. Great. One more? Do So yeah, um, both. So it depends on what the farmer needs. Some farmers own their own land. Let's say they own 100 acres they're farming. 100 acres across the street comes up for sale. There's actually no need for them to own that land from their point of view. So we'll lease it to them. And it's an evergreen lease that will go on forever. Um, and we'll never sell the land out from under them. They can purchase it after a seven year vesting period at market price at that time. We also do mortgages, which were sort of forced on us because a lot of states have anti-corporate ownership laws. So Minnesota, Iowa, Nebraska, there's a bunch of Midwestern states. Um, so we had to do mortgages as a way to offer financing. Mortgages have been a really great way for us to get more cash in our door up front because of the way that they're structured. Um, whereas our leases are a fixed rate plus a variable return based on the farmer's success. So anyways, we do both. Um, but we're never, you know, we're never getting into a situation where the farmer isn't happy with the way we finance the land. We're reacting to what they need and what works for their business model. Yes and no, but ultimately, and I think this is an important point, we do one thing really well, and that's what's led to our, I think, our success. And um, that doesn't mean that we don't do some of that, but every farmer is running their own business and they are making the decisions that they need to make to pay their rent on time, which is really what we care about. And so depending on our local knowledge in a certain region, we might do a lot based on our experience, but we don't have like an official technical assistance program. We've also gotten some grants from the USDA where we're helping pay for uh, soil health improvements and we're actually studying the effects of our financial products on soil health improvement. So there is stuff, some stuff there, but I always kind of couch on the side of no, because ultimately there are other more vertically integrated models that is not us. We are, we are almost like a bank financing land, and, and we just try to be the best at that that we can be. Great. Thank you. Um, so I, there's the land piece, which we've just talked about one component of that. Um, we also heard in the last session about the capital infrastructure needs around processing distribution, some of those challenges, and they have their own particular set of financing needs. Um, I don't know that we have specific expertise on the panel in terms of that area of capital, but Actually, Victor probably un unfortunately does. Unfortunately, I'm spending a lot of um, Great. Well, and then also thinking about um, just the different forms of capital that need to come to the table. So, you know, a lot of people, um, ourselves included, are thinking about blended capital and what does that mean and how can we think about leveraging different forms of capital, philanthropic included, um, to help support um, some of these transitional periods, these valleys of death or longer, I think, than valleys in many instances in food and ag, which 
opens up a whole other conversation around why and investing in food and agriculture is so so different uh, and where the opportunity set is. So just with that kind of context, maybe turn to Victor to share a bit more about your you know current work, work with S2G, well, your, your actually, reflections on yeah, the space. First, I actually want to really thank Alex for the work that Iroquois Valley is doing. It was really a pioneer in... Um, these land transition uh, issues and uh, innovative model at a time when nobody was innovating. And so first to just, everybody should really give <laughs> these guys a hand. And I'll, I'll pass that on to Dave Miller, who's really responsible for it, our yeah. CEO and founder, but I, he'll, well, he'll love to hear that. Yeah, He I loves have. accolades. <laughs> <laughs> um, what they've started is now really as you said, there are a lot of different models and a lot of experimentation uh, going on uh, from the investment in the model end, these vertically integrated, you know, um, you know, land funds, the corporations starting to get, you know, involved in trying to use land acquisition and transition to ensure ultimately um, the promise that they're making to their consumers. Because when you put out a product and you're saying it's organic or it has these specs and the <coughs> ingredients, you're going to be held to task every year going forward on this to the point where at some point blockchain is going to actually be there to hold you honest. So all of this work on the soil side and on the um, growing practices side um, are all becoming more sophisticated and part of a much broader, you know, sort of movement within uh, you know, the food industry, and like I said, Iroquois was one of the first, uh, you know, to really get this um, going. Um, to something much less exciting, I can talk about infrastructure, <laughs> um, but the way I look at it, and it's actually interesting, so there's a lot of investment that's gone in on the brand side, right? So what's the next, you know, nutritional, dense, you know, um, better for you, you know, on-trend, you know, Bone investment. broth. Exactly. Um, and a lot of capital going into that. And then there's also now a lot of capital going in, you know, on the land side. And so like, okay, how do you create these supply chains that ultimately meet the promise of the brand to the uh, consumer? What nobody's working on is the processing side. And it is the place where the rubber hits the road and it is not pretty. And so you have to, it makes sense because all of these factories that you can imagine that were basically built to crank out cheap calories and crappy food, you know, with sugar additives and stabilizers and all this stuff has been kind of in a groove for 70 years. And along come, you know, these new brands who want to do something, you know, different and they walk into these facilities and they're speaking a completely different language. And it's incredibly inefficient. It's, um, you can't manage quality level, any of those things. So I think one of the next big areas, which again is not sexy at all, and I can tell you stories, um, is investment into processing infrastructure um, because it's the only way this whole momentum change actually goes you know, all the way through the system. So. Uh, I don't know if that answers your Could, question. Couldn't agree more and certainly tracks with our own experience and some of the companies in our portfolio and where they're hitting bottlenecks to scaling up um, fall exactly in that area and thinking about, you know, what does that mean from a financing standpoint and what are the funds, what are the innovative models that are going to need to be brought into the equation to address the needs in the way that Iroquois pioneered on the land side. So I, I agree that that's, that's coming and maybe in this room we'll work it out somehow together. Um, we are over time, uh, unfortunately, because again, this is a topic that we could, I know the three of us could talk about um, for a long time, but uh, in the interest of having you all been here for two hours plus um, and the need to move into a regional working session, um, I think we're gonna close now. Amy will set us off into that part Thank of the day. You. Thank you so much. <laughs>